So the first question that I usually ask all of my guests is a bit unconventional. It's how has your faith in however you conceptualize or think about the word faith shape who you are and what you do in the world? I guess, yeah, depending on how you define faith. I mean, I, um, I, I guess, you know, in a very kind of woo woo way, I kind of believe that, you know, we are on this earth because um, if we can leave it in a slightly better way than the way we found it, um, or if our contribution to it can be a positive one, um, then that is a life well lived. And so I hope that, you know, the work that I do reflects that and that um, it, it, it contributes towards, you know, finding the truth and to empathizing with people around the world and to understanding, you know, otherness and um, realizing that that our world is very interconnected in ways that we don't necessarily know or imagine to be important, but that I really do believe are. Um, Yeah. Nice. I haven't thought about it for a while though. So (laughs) I know it always catches people off guard. (laughs) Um, Can, can you just walk, uh, us through like your early days as a journalist like what was it that initially um, shaped your desire to pursue this path yeah um, well, I didn't really know what I wanted to do but I I guess like from early early days you know I my dad's from uh, Hong Kong China and um, my mom's from the UK and I think that if when you grow up in a kind of mixed household you're always sort of feeling a little bit like you don't fit in anywhere and then you know you go to China and you realize you also don't fit in there um, but it also kind of gives you an interest and a curiosity for the world and it also gives you um, an understanding for the world in the sense that you know you go you get you know, a privileged position to be able to to go to you know this, the other side of the world that felt so foreign at the time um, and to realize that you know all people have the same fears and the same joys and the same love and the same lusts and etc cetera, etc cetera. so um, I guess that's kind of what you know sparked my interest in doing something around humanity um, and trying to better understand our world. Um, and then you know I moved to China after I graduated, and um, a lot of the stories that I was reading in Western media were, you know, very kind of black and white. It felt like it was either kind of big, bad, scary China, or it was this weird, quirky China that no one would ever understand. Um, so I kind of got my I guess journalistic chops there um in a weird roundabout way because I started off working for Chinese state media which is a really great way to learn everything you don't want to do in journalism but um but yeah and then I started you know writing articles that I hoped uh of you know things that I was seeing around and of people that I was speaking to around me um and just trying to kind of better understand the place that I was living in really yeah you've reported extensively across the world, including, uh, as you're saying, China, Afghanistan, Syria, Yemen, Russia, Ukraine, and the list goes on. Um, I, I kind of want to start with Syria, because I feel like that's a story that many journalists say has impacted them greatly. Given that Assad has essentially won the war, how does looking back on your Syria reporting sit with you today, given the current state of the country? it's kind of an awakening call because I think that so many journalists, you know, start their career with these very idealistic goals of, you know, changing the world and making everything better. And, you know, once you report on something thoroughly and well enough, then it's going to change people's mindsets and then policies are going to be changed, et cetera. And, you know, obviously that's not the reality in a lot of cases, you know, sometimes it does. And sometimes, you know, change can happen as a result of reporting and then it feels really incredible But most of the time, you know, the reporting doesn't have the mega impact that you'd want it to. And Syria is, you know, one of those examples where, you know, you can highlight all the suffering, you can highlight um, the repression of the Assad regime, and you can highlight the bombardment. And, you know, I've I've covered it from from all different angles and from, you know, all different areas, from from government-held Syria to the... um, the last rebel stronghold, so the Kurdish held Syria. And, you know, there's so much suffering. It does, it, it, you're right, it is one of those places that really sticks with you because it's so raw and there's so much of it and it's so complex to try and understand. And yet there's so much vulnerability at the heart of it. And it's really, yeah, disheartening to see that there hasn't really been much change as a result of it and that you know um however many years later the Assad regime is 
you know, stronger than ever and in a position where they are you know, ruling with an iron fist, despite the fear slash acquiescence of the of the population. Um, and Afghanistan is obviously a more recent you've I mean, you've reported and traveled there extensively, um, reported on the state of women's rights, among other things. Um, you've interviewed Taliban members. Um, and this one interview really stuck out to me when you were I think you were interviewing a judge and you basically were like, you asked him, like, do you think a woman could hold your position? And he kind of scoffed at you and was like, a woman, you know, has, has a lesser brain than a man or something. <laughs> um, and I just like, yeah, I wonder, like, as a woman yourself, how does that just sit with you in your body? Like, how do you like, do you get angry? Do you get sad? Do you feel compelled to like, toe the line between journalism and activism? Like, how do you process those emotions as a woman yourself? Mm. Yeah, good question. I think that there's two things. Firstly, it, it, in the moment, it makes you sad because there, there's, you know, half the population are obviously women and the population of Afghanistan, as we know, is having to, to struggle through that and what it means to be living under Taliban leadership right now. And it's not pretty, you know, that despite all the gains that they may have made, and it was definitely not perfect beforehand but you know they, they did there were so many games that were made over the last 20 years or so and and then seeing so much of that fall apart and you know we just see it you know even this week I think you know the women are no longer able to go to beauty salons and they're not allowed to go to parks and they're not allowed to get education and they're not allowed to go um you know work in NGOs they're not allowed to work or really be in any public space and so it's really it's devastating that that belief is so ingrained um, I actually remember having a conversation with a, a a guy over there who was actually, you know, my age and um, and really sweet and you know spoke perfect English and very well educated and really smart. And he was talking to me about you know how the Taliban coming and taking over was probably a good thing for Afghanistan, but also for for men because it seemed like women had been getting an unfair advantage over the last 20 years because um, it meant that they were in a position where they, you know, could basically what he was saying was, you know, fairly compete for jobs or positions. Um, and he didn't like that. And um, that really hit me because I was like, if someone this kind of well-educated and young and smart and worldly can think like that, um, and can just see it as, you know, whatever the advantage might be for him. Um, it's really, it's really disturbing and it's really dark. Um, I guess like on a personal level, you know, when I come back from trips like that, I firstly feel so lucky and privileged to not be living in those circumstances and to be able to do what I want to do and to be able to compete in the job market against men and to be able to, um, you know, say my mind and to be able to do all the things and have, um, you know, relative equality um but and it also spurs me on to I feel like those stories feel so important and I really do feel the weight of those stories and I would want to continue reporting on them I just um the last time I went to Afghanistan we got um uh, deported and told that we couldn't report that after that report came out um which, was, which I felt really sad about because I think it's so important to keep telling those stories especially you know in the case of Afghanistan when it's just you know, gone from, you know, being back in back when the Taliban took over, obviously at the top of our news feeds to just really sinking into oblivion, in part because the Taliban have made it very difficult to report there. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I definitely feel the weight of that responsibility. And I definitely feel on a personal level, like it's, um, it's more important than ever to report on those stories. Uh, so after your most recent trip to Afghanistan, like what, what do you see on the ground? Like what were women saying mm -hmm. to you? So I went, um, this was just after the Taliban had, um, had seized Kabul and um, it was, it was, you know, we, we spent a lot of time in Kabul where obviously, you know, that's kind of been where a lot of the changes have happened over the last 20 years. And so I think a lot of the women there um, were, were, were experiencing the most kind of trauma and unease and anxiety about the changes that were to come um and and that was different in a place like Kandahar that we went to where you know the women's rights is just not you know a priority for them what that is their priority is being able to feed their kids and to be able to um 
to be able to you know n not be worried about um about being bombed or their family members being bombed when they step out the door um but yeah certainly in Kabul those changes were very acute and you know we the story that we were focused on is is kind of you know how those changes play out for women and especially within the justice system itself, because the justice system has obviously been completely rehauled since the Taliban took over. So now it's all under a very strict interpretation of Sharia law, um, which which turned out meant that we dived into a particular case of a woman who um, had been very severely domestically abused and really, really terrifying story. Um, but she was really just not able to get justice in any way. Um, and it felt like the cards were really stacked against her within that current system. Um, and yeah, I think that the fear that a lot of women were feeling um, about those changes and about just their complete lack of power anymore within the structure of society was very, very palpable and was, um, yeah, really heartbreaking to see actually. Did you leave feeling a sense that there was any like hope for women and girls to rejoin the workforce or be able to learn again in, in recent, like in the near future, or is that not? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to know. And it depends because obviously there's, you know, different fractions within the Taliban and there's some that feel you know, that are much more hardline and definitely feel like um, that, you know, women should not be getting educated and, um, you know, all the things that, you know, the Taliban kind of stood for in the nineties still stand today. And then there's, you know, more of a reformist, branch which you know feel like there should be some allowances made and they also see the the benefits of that you know in terms of releasing some international aid um given that the country is so reliant on that um and so it's hard to know but i would say that you know obviously given the news that we've seen over the last couple of years since the taliban have been in power it's not been promising, you know, a lot of those rights have been stripped away, you know, they're not allowed to um, work in public spaces, and they're not allowed to get education. And, you know, a lot of these things have been, have been really taken from them. I guess, like, what gives me hope is just some of the people that, that we've met and some of the people that I've stayed in touch with. Um, I mean, Mabuba Siraj, um, you're probably familiar with, she's such an incredible woman who runs this, um, this shelter in Kabul for domestic um, abuse victims and you know really fights for women's rights and um, you know she if you talk to her she is positive and she kind of does see a path forward and she says that you know once once women are brought to the negotiating table and once women are, um, are able to express themselves and once the Taliban realize that you know that, that they need to include those voices then things might change um, so I guess like having people like her who have not fled the country but continue to stay there and to continue to um, to insist on her voice being heard, um, that's that's what gives me hope really. Yeah, that's such bravery. Like I can't even fathom that amount of courage. It's amazing. Yeah, I remember she said something that was so chilling to me at the time that really hit me, which was that you know she was just she's she's got a very blunt way of talking, and she said you know the West doesn't care, the US doesn't care about women's rights. They never cared about Afghan women's rights, you know, despite it being used for them as a tool to, you know, come to Afghanistan and to do this and that, the emancipation of women has never been a priority for the West. And that's clear in the way that they dropped us like a hot potato, she said. Um, and that was just really chilling because it was really just apparent that she and so many others felt completely abandoned by the West and by the US especially, and that, they were now on their own and that it is their battle to fight and it's their um it's their rights that they need to take yeah i also saw that animation that you guys did on that it was amazing yeah wasn't it that was incredible it was so powerful. yeah yeah that was because i mean we needed to find a way to yeah tell a couple of those women's stories and obviously the the dangers around speaking out now have become even greater which is what, partly why it's so difficult to report there at the moment um, but yeah, Grace Shin, who's our animator at, at Vice, really took that on board and just um, went to town on it, and it was just yeah. like yeah, a really powerful portrayal. I thought of of um, of some of the stories of domestic abuse. Yeah, yeah. I maybe it, like it's always been this way, but it feels like the news cycle is super depressing, like extra <laughs> depressing. Um, when you're the one actually covering these issues especially about like 
the regression of women's rights around the world. Um, back to you know the earlier question of just like as a woman yourself reporting on this, how does how does that sit with you? But but generally speaking, like you know, how do you avoid burnout? Yeah, well, that's why I'm at home at the moment. <laughs> it's important, I think, to kind of take a breather because often. I think that you don't necessarily process things when you're there at the mo in the at the time and you kind of compartmentalize what's going on and you know that you know you have a story to get and you have people to speak to and you have a job to do essentially um and then I find personally that it does catch up with you and you kind of process it at different points I I went recently to a place to a country that I shall remain nameless um, but, uh, we had a very hairy situation there um where we had you know guns pointed to our heads and we were detained for a while and it was um it was somewhat scary um and yeah it takes a while to kind of um it, it like in the moment it doesn't hit you and then you know throughout like weeks and weeks later there's like various points where it um it catches up with you yeah I think like that burnout can be really real. And it's not even just actually, as I'm talking, it's, it's not even just those moments of, um, of like, you know, real fear that you have to process. It's more the emotional toll of, you know, that there is this secondhand trauma that I think that a lot of um, people who especially work in conflict zones, I think, um, experience. And, you know, I'm very lucky because I'm able to kind of dip in and out and I can, you know, come back to my home and, and have a, um, a, oat milk flat white in my kitchen and it's a it's um it's a really unique position to be able to flit in and out of these places but the 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 thing about going to meet people in some of the most vulnerable moments of their lives and in some of the most unique and heartbreaking and terrifying moments of their lives and being let into their stories just really means that you take that responsibility on your shoulders and over time, it does, um, it does, it, it grates on you, or it wears on you. Um, and I think that to do this job well, you have to be able to take a break and you have to be able to um, continue to feel that empathy because otherwise it, um, I think there's a line in which at various points in my career, I think I've crossed because at some points you just, um, you stop, you get kind of filled up on that trauma and you stop being able to, feel it from other people and you stop being able to empathize and that I think can be really dangerous for for doing this job because I just don't think that um I, I, I think that's the that's the point to stop um so yeah I think like I guess in answer to your question in terms of avoiding that burnout I think like taking breaks from it is really important and I think that um you know doing I'm lucky enough to be able to do different types of stories as well so I'm not only um reporting on um really harrowing topics although that does seem to be uh a, a unique <laughs> especially my real forte um, <laughs> but yeah I mean it's also one of those things that you know I think that it, it's what gives me purpose as well so I feel like I'd be completely lost without being able to do it um and and once I've had a break from it and I feel like I that is what drives me and it, I can't wait to get back out and, and to tell those stories yeah, it's interesting when you talk about empathy and being desensitized and like, um, not you, but you're saying like that if you ever get to that point, it's not really great to keep going in that mm. state of mind. I think about, I was living in Israel, Palestine earlier this year, um, mm. and this is just coming to my mind right now, but I was covering the Israeli elections, like for advice actually, uh, mm -hmm. but I have friends on both sides. It was just, it was really, it was intense. And mm. um I remember I was like, I have to like get out of here <laughs> like yeah. uh, by the end. And, um, and I remember talking to a friend over dinner. I was like, I feel like I failed. Like, I don't feel like I like, why did I feel like I had to leave? Like, that's not what a real like journalist would do or whatever. Mm -hmm. he, was like, he was like, no, I think it's that you had empathy. You can't live in that state forever. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, firstly, that is an impossible conflict to <laughs> be able to like to like feel like you've made progress with because um, yeah, covering that conflict that people are so you know on one side or the other and it's very very difficult to change any yeah. mind on it. Um, but also, I think it you know these kind of things do hit harder when you're living there and when you you know you start to have friends there and you it, they hit in a different way. That like for me that was um 
uh, when I was in Hong Kong and the protests broke out both in 2014 and then in 2019 and you know seeing so many of my friends like desperately fighting for what they believed in and knowing that they what they'd been through those last few years and also knowing you know, and having you know a personal connection to it my, my dad's from Hong Kong so um yeah those those times really do hit hard and it feels so yeah difficult to um to let go of it because you can't and you feel guilty for letting go of it and you feel like yeah you're you're never going to be doing a good, a good enough job I think yeah yeah for sure do you do you feel like mental health is prioritized and completely rid of stigma in journalism today or do you feel like there's a ways to go no I think there's a way to go I think it's probably got better um certainly I think that you know uh, a few years ago you know it just wasn't talked about at all and it's definitely still got kind of you know this macho mentality around it um but I definitely think that there is um certainly within different newsrooms an encouragement to um seek help and actually you know I've been lucky with Vice they've I, I speak to a therapist and I um I try to force myself to to talk about it because I do think that it helps with that processing um because otherwise it does just inevitably catch up with you um but yeah it's 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 tough because I mean I I do a lot of pieces actually around mental health in war zones and I was thinking actually about this today because you know I covered um mental health crisis really in Yemen as well as in Ukraine and it's interesting because when there is active conflict and when there's active war it's really just a so often a case of survival and you know the and I spoke to a lot of you know Ukrainian soldiers and to um and to people in Yemen and it's really encouraged not to talk about it and and that's for a reason because you can't let you know these emotions take over you in those moments you it's really you have to keep it down in order to survive and then only when you step out of that and in some cases you know in Yemen only when the the war ends and we've seen this with Vietnam in the past as well it takes you know 10, 20 years for that to catch up and those traumas last for a really, really long time. It's something that probably will be studied a, <laughs> a decade from now. Yeah, or... yeah. That's what um, this this doctor in Yemen told me that. He was like, it's a tsunami that just like comes and comes and catches. And it's like always behind the, yeah. um, the war itself, but it's like definitely on the tail end and you'll definitely never outrun it. Yeah, um, on that same topic kind of, uh, you've received some some heavy backlash for some of your stories. <laughs> um, I like, I'm sorry, uh, there's so many of them. I mean, I often wonder, though, that like how much of that backlash, not just for you, but for any female journalist is at its core sexist. Mm. How do you personally deal with, with that? Well, I think that, you know, doing it like if you are doing journalism right, you're going to receive backlash yeah. because there's always going to be um, a side that, you know, doesn't agree with your reporting. And um, yeah, and uh, you're you're going to get it from, from both sides. And if you do it well, you do get it from both sides because you'll, yeah. you know, be on one side of the conflict or whatever it is and report from one side and speak to the people you're speaking to and, and hear that side of the story. And then, you know, like often what happens is then you'll get a bunch of followers from from that side of things. And then yeah. you go to the other side and you talk to other people and you hear that side of the story. And then um, the other people immediately <laughs> start sending you hatred. Yeah. Um, so I think it's I think it's inevitable. Um, yeah. With the China stuff, I mean, and, and actually China is a good example of um, getting from both ends, really, because there's a lot of people who are kind of people would call them you know genocide deniers but um there's there's people who deny that the Uyghur Muslim minority have um received repression which they have there's mountains and mountains of evidence on it from the satellite imagery to um to government leaked documents to um there's just so much evidence um that it like baffles me that people are still denying it but obviously disinformation is very very real and um terrifying mm -hmm. um so from that side you know that you know, people are convinced that their whatever they're reading or listening to on tucker carlson is accurate <laughs> um and then on the on the other side of things you know i there's 
there's actually a very prominent um, kind of far right um, Chinese diaspora movement in the US right now, um, mm. which people have grabbed onto. And I did a story on Guo Wenguei, that's this uh, Chinese tycoon who partnered up with Steve Bannon and, um, and started his own kind of disinformation campaign. And, you know, once my story went out on him, he kind of, his, his trolls uh, came after me. And, and yeah, a lot of that has definite sexist undertones and sometimes not even undertones, but just like right out there, they'll put a, one of them, one of them was um, me on a, uh, with a Playboy body, which actually I was <laughs> fine with. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think when it gets most harmful and most hurtful is when it um, becomes very personal and particularly when, you know, previously people have contacted my family members and um, mm. told them that I've been, you know, captured by ISIS and that, um, you know, that I deserve to be, you know, tortured and raped and blah, blah, blah. So I think like when when that happens and when my family are hearing about it, it's um, a little bit uncalled for. I, I, I don't know if that level of bullying really or trolling would happen to a male colleague of mine yeah I just see it so much more with women journalists than I do with male journalists and I, yeah, I think that's true yeah yeah and so I always wondered like how you you know and and so much of it is just like completely as you're saying like disinformation and just blatantly untrue so it's like you, you need a, a bit of a tough skin with it because otherwise yeah you're not really able to do the job yeah like what what do you feel like is the most challenging part about being a journalist today? Um, These existential questions. <laughs> <laughs> it's good. It's um, it's a good uh, time to be thinking about this, actually. Um, so many challenges. <laughs> I think that, on well, on a practical level, it's just very difficult to report in places that I'm interested in, often like authoritarian regimes and... Um, I've actually been lucky recently, more well, lucky, <laughs> depending on your opinion of lucky, but being able to get to a lot of these places and um, report on them. But it, it it's made very difficult, especially with, you know, surveillance technology coming on so much and um, AI, etc. So being able to report from these places has become very difficult and I imagine will become a lot more difficult very, very quickly. I was just doing an undercover story um, recently and as I was doing it, I was thinking, like, even in five years' time, this is going to be impossible, right? Because facial facial recognition technology is coming on so quickly. Mm. Um, there's so many ways to figure out who someone is. And it's just very, very difficult. And, and obviously, on the other side of things, you know, criminal networks that I was looking into, um, their technology is coming on so quickly. So it's, um, I think that's that's a challenge for sure. Um and 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 being able to and, and journalists have obviously been targeted for a long time, but I do think that there is um, a target on our on our backs, especially from a lot of these authoritarian regimes. Um, yeah, and then and then also I'd guess like you know the model of journalism is also changing, which is something I think about a lot. Um, and you know we've seen kind of the downfall of of Vice. Um, and I think that that's a shame. And I think it's really sad for all of Vice's flaws, which I'm acutely aware of. There's also, you know, amazing things that have come out of that kind of journalism, I think, which has really pushed news journalism in a way that it needed to be pushed. Um, and, you know, we've been everywhere and done these stories every which way and spoken to so many people and, you know, had this real focus on international journalism um, that has forced people to think about um, conflicts and crises and people and otherness in a way that I think that, um, yeah, needed to happen. Um, so I think that like financial model of journalism is difficult as we kind of wrestle with figuring out what's happening with streamers and with everything else. I kind of speaks to my next question of just like, wh where do you see the future of journalism? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Um, I'd like to think, and I do believe that, stories are valuable and yeah. that one thing that I hope will last even through AI and the ability for AI to tell stories um I think that you know humans need stories and so I think that uh, and, and actually like the founding of 
Vice, I think, was largely based on Shane Smith's refusal to believe that young kids um, don't want to hear good stories in you know longer formats. I think, and that you know they don't have any attention spans. Um, so I do think that that will outlast everything. Um, yeah. I do have faith in that, and I think that there's never been a more important time to do journalism well. And I also think that there is you know incredible tools at our hands now that we didn't necessarily have, even like. Um, over the last few years, I think my personally, I'm, I'm proud that my reporting has come on because I'm able to now use um, OSIN technology, you know, open source investigative techniques in order to figure out um, figure out where stories are going and to be able to investigate deeper into things. Um, and there's, you know, the social media has just like blown up our ability to reach out to people and to connect with people and to understand stories across the world. Um, and there's so so many different ways in which to tell stories, I think now, um, which I'm, and, and even the way in which we consume stories. I think I, I mean, even I obviously love, you know, TV and broadcast journalism, but I also love listening to um, to audio books, mm-hmm. to podcasts and to, um, and I, I love like the, I also love, I'm a bit of a traditionalist and loving print journalism, but um I also like consume a lot of stuff on on social media and everything else so I just like think that there's we just need to be more creative with it and to make sure that we are kind of I guess like providing to these to to move with the times and providing to multiple different platforms rather than I guess just feeding these um beasts of like traditional cable news I guess which is like well not even cable news because that's not how we traditionally um consumed media but I guess yeah just moving with the times and making sure that um our information which is very hard fought for and accurate and um fact checked and all the rest of it is what's winning rather than kind of the disinformation that is so much easier to spread how would you advise young women who want to pursue a career in journalism today what advice would you give them I guess um I guess firstly figuring out you know what stories it is you want to tell and what stories that um are important um and also I think I always thought that I needed to and my career probably isn't a good example of this because I did go to very far-flung places and tell these stories but I think I always felt like I needed to go and do that but I as as I've kind of um, I guess matured in my career I've also realized that there's stories everywhere and there's so many um important stories to tell on our doorstep and um that you know your next door neighbor might have a great story and that your the story of your the origins of your cat might be great etc so they are really like there isn't um i think that it, it can sometimes feels like such an elitist industry that is really difficult to crack into um but i would definitely encourage people to look for stories you know around them um and then just to i guess you know, follow the journalist that you're interested in emulating and to follow the read, read, read. I read so much. And I think that's what um, helped my journalism, just in terms of like understanding what's out there already and how you can contribute to that and what kind of stuff you enjoy consuming. Um, Yeah. And then fighting like hell to try and get those stories out there, I guess. For it and ignore the trolls. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so the well, last... laughing, at the trolls. laughing at them is more interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Just take their uh, Playboy like memes with a grain of salt. <laughs> yeah. um, so the last question that I end all my interviews on is, what is the more to your story? This podcast is called More to Her Story. The platform that I run is called More to Her Story. So there's mm-hmm. more to everyone's story than we can see on the surface. So, so what is the more to your story? What does that mean? (laughs) (laughs) So so basically it's like not to do with your profession. I mean, it could be to do with your profession, but it's more about like who you are on a personal level, stuff that people don't really see generally on the surface. Like maybe Mm. something that someone wouldn't guess about you. Mm. It's, (laughs) this is like a therapy session. That's, um, (laughs) Literally, the question that my therapist has been asking me the last couple of weeks. She's like, really? You're more, than your, you're more than your career. Because I think that I so often just like I put my whole identity around you know, what I do. And it's been so important to me for the last um, 
few years that uh, I've, I over define myself by that. And I think that um, it's so not, like I, the reason I moved back to the UK is that it's so nice to be around family and to be like doing like really basic things like mm -hmm. cooking and um meditating and just be feeling like a like a human yeah. I sound like a very broken person but I swear that I'm not <laughs> mom, then that's also okay um but yeah just uh I don't know if that answers your question at all I don't know I don't know what else there is but I I think that there is a human beyond these this journalist definitely there is yeah that's great yeah it's important as well and it's good yeah. that I feel like it's really good to recognize that because I feel like so many people especially people who do this kind of work and who are like on the like who are high profile people you know um mm -hmm. and the things of like their news organization I mean it's hard not to tie your identity to your career yeah and it's also really easy to get swept up in that and then to and then your kind of feeling about how you're doing or progressing in life is just solely determined by like how that last story was perceived and you can't have any control over how you know your last stories are perceived and so um or or you know if they strike a chord or if they make changes or whatever it is um so yeah like having some grounding and roots is so important and like I, I was surprised at how much I needed that I think because I've been I was living in China and then Hong Kong and then New York and and all over um and it's been yeah I think really grounding for me to to have a bit of a, a home yeah and a little bit of a wedding coming up right <laughs> I do have that a wedding, yeah yeah we're uh yeah I'm getting married next year <laughs> 